On the agenda tonight, we're going to be taking a look at Mississippi John Hurt, and he's going to be performing You Got to Walk That Lonesome Valley. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus, and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So, first of all, I don't have a year for this performance. I'm going to place it at the early 60s. So if anybody does know the date, stick it in the comments below, and I can maybe put it into the title. But this video is only 2 minutes 47 in length, so we are going to watch it the whole way through, and we'll get into the analysis afterwards. But let's get John up on screen and see how he gets it's on. What we play this thing up there, right? And there we have it. As you can see, it does cut out suddenly, unfortunately, so that's why I was hovering over that pause button. But with John's performance here, there is so much going on with that right hand. If you just watch his thumb, just jumping between the low E string and the D string, he also jumps to the A string as well, is so solid timing wise, that's effectively supplying the bass notes of the performance. And we have this counter melody being played at the top end of the guitar on the high E string and B string, and also down to the G, and he's using his first finger and second finger. The good thing about this video as well is that we do get a fair amount of fretboard action on screen, and that is rarely the case when sometimes they seem to focus on anything other than the guitar. But here we have a director and cameraman who are focusing on that fret work and the right hand, you can see really clearly the way that John is jumping between strings here. And on the left hand, the way that he's just using that G shape with his third finger on the low E string and his little finger on that high E string, also placing that first finger two frets down 
on the B string and just moving that shape up and down. He does come over to the A string in order to supply that second fret with the second finger to add a little bit of a run in there. But the left hand is gonna be relatively simple, but it's the right hand that is picking out all of these notes and let me throw in there about the syncopation and this is the massive part of playing that is gonna be so difficult in order to nail this, but also to sing, let me throw that in there, The John is playing this and singing at the same time, making it doubly impressive, but just the guitar playing in itself is impressive enough because of that syncopation. Just to give a bit of context as well, John started playing the guitar aged nine and he used to play it in secret because it was actually a friend of his mother who used to visit and bring his guitar around and then he'd go off to see his girlfriend or something like that and John would pick up the guitar and just teach himself how to play it. But we're talking about the 1910s, 1920s, because John was born in 1893. So we're talking about well, well before a lot of fingerstyle techniques came along. And this is why when John started playing like this, people started to listen and it just so happened that he wasn't discovered for quite a while and hadn't been playing for about 30 years until he was then discovered again by somebody who heard him playing and then started to get a bit more notoriety and became a lot more popular and known in the music industry at that time. But getting into the playing, because when I mentioned the syncopation, syncopation by the way, is a difference in rhythms or a variety of rhythms played in conjunction with each other. To give an example of that, when John is playing here, his thumb is jumping between the low E string and the D string, also the A string, but he's got this. And it's very even. Now, if my third finger plays the high E string at the same time, I'll be going. like that. So you can hear both of the notes are being played at the same time, whereas that's not what is going on with John here. And a lot of picking patterns that you might have are generally just straight down the line. So if I pick out as an example, I'm going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And each finger and my thumb take it in turns. So it means that I'm not picking two strings at the same time and I'm not going out of that sequence and doing anything that's syncopated. It's all just straight down the line and very easy and organized. Whereas when John's playing, he's got this, this little bit of emphasis up at the top that is off beat and it's not going with what the thumb's doing. So. When you first try playing this, as I did not very long ago before making this video, you start to understand how difficult it is to keep this organized in your head for the thumb to be supplying those root notes and that bass line, but then to throw in that high E string and the emphasis. And I'm only using my third finger here. John also throws in his second finger. So really slowing things down. And just to mention about the tempo of this performance, John does gradually speed up throughout. But here, hopefully you'll be able to tell that the high E string is being picked at a different rate of the low E string and the D string. So that constant bass line we've got going on here I'm going to slow it down even more so you get an appreciation for where that high E string comes in. We've got this. Like that. So it's doing something totally different. So we've got this G shape that just moves up and down the fretboard, played with the third finger and the little finger. John sometimes adds in a little bit on the A string and the D string, for example, where we've got this. That second finger on that second fret there. You were to hear that little change in there. So as we progress through it, we've got this, and this is really difficult to play because of the 
syncopation that's going on, it is something that's going to take a little bit of time to get used to, and certainly for me to get used to it if I was to play it up to speed on the whole way through. But getting this... We've got that kind of thing into then the G, and I shouldn't have taken my hand off there because it's just going to be the same shape moving up, and we've got this... that kind of thing moving up and down. And the eagle-eyed amongst you would have seen that I'm just using my third finger on the right hand here, and I'm substituting my third finger for John's second finger. As you can see, he actually anchors to the body of the guitar with his third finger on the right hand and doesn't use it. So he uses his first and second finger, whereas on the high E string playing standard finger style, I tend to always use my third finger because that's generally where it sits there for traditional finger style. But when we start to add in the extra finger, and in this case, it's the first finger of John's, then you start entering a world of hurt because he's now syncopating across all three fingers so that the sequence that he's playing is even more complicated. So to try and give an example of that, and I say try because I might not be able to do it, when we've got this... Without the second finger, the third finger and the thumb are doing separate things. So you've got to try and get the second finger to pop in there and do its own thing in between those notes. So we've got this... and like that, and I just threw in that second finger there, like that. And when John's playing it, it's most evident up at the top because as he moves up, you'll hear the change and you'll hear that first finger being played on the B string. Also, when he moves all the way up, you definitely hear that first finger in there, and sometimes it sounds like he's playing a muted low E string or A string with that right hand, and you don't get the ring out of the note that's being fretted, but because he's just picking so quickly and going through it and just keeping that rhythm going, you don't really notice that there are any muted notes in there, and you might actually be doing that on purpose just to keep it driving along. So once you start throwing in that second finger as well, like I said, you're entering a world of hurt because you need another level of independence with that right hand. This is so impressive because watching John do this, if you don't play guitar, you would definitely take this for granted as just somebody playing the guitar and singing over the top and it's easy to do. And it's, it is anything but easy to do. John just makes it look so easy. So some really cool technique going on here from John. And again, let me reference the fact that he started playing in 1902. So it's not as if he could load up YouTube and see about finger style technique and syncopation and getting your fingers to work independently. He just started playing like this. And that's why it was a way of playing that stood out because nobody else was doing this. And it was so difficult to do as well, as I've just demonstrated probably very effectively that you can't just pick up a guitar, even if you already play guitar, and play through this because it takes so much independence with your fingers, so much practice, and you'd really have to bed in this muscle memory to then start playing it faster and gradually speeding it up. You have to play it so slowly to begin with just to get your head around the independent things that are going on with each finger and the thumb going the whole time on those bass notes as well. I'm just gonna mention as well about John's voice because he has that relaxed vocal delivery that is so relatable, and this is the point, that John isn't trying to sing like anybody else, he's just playing his own way and singing his own way. And this is why the songs connect in such a deeper way than somebody who's trying to do something that isn't natural. John is just singing the way that he does. And it's great to see this originality and how relaxed John is when he performs as well. Having that technical ability, you can tell that he's practiced a hell of a lot in order to make this so subconscious that he can just sing over the top in such a relaxed style. It is very much that folk vocal delivery and that would go on to inspire so many folk artists. And I know that he would also be described as country blues, delta blues as well, 
But you can see how this relaxed vocal, the storytelling quality of it, then passed over into folk music and people could connect with an audience because they're using that voice that sits within their talking range. And John isn't trying to hit notes here. That's the point, that the vocal is relaxed because the concentration is on the story of the song and telling that story to an audience. But I do want to get into a little bit of John's history and career. He started playing at the age of nine, like I've already mentioned. He would play old time music and it sounds a bit silly saying old time. We're talking about the 1910s, but he was still playing music that was considered old time in those days. He'd play for friends at dances. He was also offered a place in a medicine show and if you don't know what a medicine show is, it's a show that went around where they would sell you medicine or the elixir of life, whatever they would call it, that would be a cure for all of your ailments. And within these shows, they had music, magic, freak shows, all that kind of stuff that I've only really seen in movies being referred to. But he didn't want to leave home because, of course, they toured around and John didn't want to do that. So he stayed at home and turned down that place in the medicine show. So in the 1920s, John teamed up with fiddler Willie Nama and Willie won the first prize in a fiddle contest, which meant that he got to do some work with OK Records. And he mentioned John's name to OK Records and it was Tommy Rockwell, who was the producer at the time, who then got John in. And John performed two sessions, one in Memphis, one in New York. And he did say that when he was recording there, he was in this huge room and they set up the microphone in such a place that he couldn't move for the whole session. And he said afterwards that his neck ached for days because he literally could not move at all. So sadly, his records failed at that point and the Great Depression was just around the corner in the late 20s going into 1930. So it meant that the record label folded as well. So John returned to work as a sharecropper and wouldn't return to music for quite a while because in 19. 1952, the anthology of American folk music was released, the album, and John was on that album. He had a version of Frankie and Spike Driver Blues, and people heard that and really enjoyed it and were wondering who John Hurt was. So, a few years later, it's actually 1963, so 11 years later, the 1928 album Avalon Blues was heard by Dick Spotswood, who was a musicologist. And he was interested to find out who John Hurt was. And he got out an atlas and found where Avalon was. And he got in touch with Tom Hoskins, one of his friends who was about to travel in that direction. And he asked him if he could take a little bit of a detour to Avalon and ask around to see if anybody knew who John Hurt was. So Tom did find a guy called John Hurt who played the guitar. And Tom asked John to play for him. And Tom knew instantly that this was indeed the John Hurt from the Avalon Blues album. So, to put it in perspective, John was 70 years of age at this point, but he hadn't lost any of his playing ability or performing ability. As we can see in this video, like I said, I'm not sure exactly when this is, but it's got to be early 60s. And in 1963, John played at the Newport Folk Festival, had a real rise in popularity there, and had a big part in the folk revival at that point as well. He performed a lot of shows, playing live. He also appeared on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. He recorded three albums for Vanguard Records. So having been away from music for such a long time, we're talking around about 30 years of just having a normal job and then getting thrown into the spotlight in 1963. Sadly, John passed away in 1966 at the age of 73 and and his last recordings that he made were recorded just five months before he died, and those were released in 1972 on the album Last Sessions. And in 2017, there was a documentary that was made about his life called American Epic, and that was an award-winning documentary. And Mississippi John Hurt is one of those guys that inspired so many future generations of players, Doc Watson, Jerry Garcia, Bob Dylan, just to name a few. And you can see certainly with that Bob Dylan example of the impact he had on folk musicians of the early 60s, 
But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock.